politics of inflation make implementing financial repression harder to do in reality than it is in the model. And what I mean by that is you're already seeing these rising prices are having political effects. Not always, but a, a lot of times when there is social unrest, and especially typically when there is a revolution of some kind, it's, it, it happens when the people just can't take it anymore, for lack of a better word. And a lot of times that has to do with their cost of living. That's when they just can't take it anymore because they're hungry, they, they're out of work, they need money. And uh, the value of their currency is, is going down, or their savings is going down. Good afternoon, Mr. Johnson. Really, uh, really appreciate you uh, coming in today and, and, and talking. Yeah, happy to be here. Uh, I've enjoyed talking with you in the past. I'm looking forward to do it again today. For those that uh, don't know who you are, uh, could you just give a little uh, background on on you and where you're at now? Sure. Uh, so my name is Brent Johnson. I have a wealth management firm called Santiago Capital, where I kind of create customized portfolios and wealth management plans, diversified wealth management plans for high net worth individuals. Uh, for the last 20 years, I was in San Francisco, but uh, recently moved to Puerto Rico. So my family and I are here now, and so far, we're really enjoying it. And um, most of my work tends to, to do with uh, the big picture, kind of macroeconomics. At least that's the part that I'm most interested in. And so I'm always you know, reading things, not just about what's going on with an individual company or an individual sector, but I'm always looking at countries as a whole, what's going on politically, what's going on economically, you know, or there's some you know, military implications or their, you know, climate implications. So it's, it's really kind of the big picture and trying try to put it all together and figure out, you know, what the puzzle's telling me. Yeah, and that, that's why I've, I've really appreciated your work and, and, and following your thoughts um, over, over the past couple of years. Um, and it seems that geopolitical uh, and, and macro seem to be colliding right now. I might, I might have that wrong, but uh, I don't know if you're yeah, seeing I, I think I think everything is colliding right now. Um, you know, there's this famous book that I think a lot of people in the last couple of years have come to know called The Fourth Turning. And it, and it was written, you know, 15 years ago or, or maybe more than that. And it talked about, you know, you go through these uh, various stages, you know, each country or, you know, kind of nation has the, the spring where everything's new and great. And then it gets into the summer and you start reaping the rewards. And then, you know, the fall comes along and things aren't quite as good. And then you eventually go into the winter, which is a crisis. And I think, uh, you know, in those fourth turnings, in those crises, you know, all these different factors kind of run into each other socially, politically, economically, you know, and. You know, I, it's kind of become a little bit of a cliche, but I actually do believe we're in this fourth journey now. And so, uh, you know, a lot of uh, institutions and familiar, uh, familiar things are kind of being challenged and perhaps going by the wayside. And it'll be interesting to see what replaces them. But uh, I don't think it's going to be boring. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's probably the easiest way to say it. Yeah. Um, there's, there's probably a dozen topics I'd like to, to speak with you about for, for hours, but, uh, today, uh, you're yeah. kind enough to, to, to join and, and talk on uh, currency war by, by Lawrence Lindsay. Um, I'll, I'll give the, the good doctor a plug. Um, but, uh, I found it quite fascinating and, uh, it's, it's well beyond my, my purview. Um, but, but you've been in this business for, for decades now. And, uh, just wondering to, to start, if you could lay out how Dr. Lindsay, sees things progressing within his fictional novel that has a number of policy implications embedded within it. Well, it's funny because, well, it's not funny. Uh, It's interesting because, you know, it's, it's kind of a historical fiction. In other words, it's, it's a fictional story that takes place amongst real events, but these real events are imagined real events. So, uh, but the, but the people and the institutions that he discusses, they're, 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 those are real institutions. There's real people in those roles. And I feel like we've kind of gotten to the place where these are the issues that they're going to be grappling with. So uh, it, it is very interesting to read a, a work of fiction, but, you know, in many ways could be, you know, a fortuitous prophecy as opposed to, you know, just a, you know, made up theory. Um, and so, you know, it's basically getting to the point where 
you know, he, he, he is saying that economics have kind of got to this point where these fiat currencies, the currencies that governments just issue and, you know, they become money by decree rather than by the market choosing it. And, you know, they, 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 they spend and they spend and they borrow and they borrow. Eventually you, end, you, you reach an end game where it just doesn't work anymore. And that's kind of the setting for this book. Uh, and uh, basically, a currency war breaks out between uh, the two global powers, which I think, as a lot of people would agree, are uh, you know the United States and China. Um, it's kind of been my impression, um, you know, as, as I study this, that there's a lot of people who have just kind of accepted the fact that at some point in the next decade or so, China is going to overtake the United States as the global hegemon. And that transition um, will likely not be smooth, but that's what's going to happen. And I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite convinced that it's going to happen as quickly and as, you know, uh, in, in the way that many people do. Um, and I think uh, the, what I liked about Larry Lindsay's book was that he didn't just kind of pander to China in this and say they're automatically going to win. Now, of course, because he's a you know a public figure in the United States, used to work for the Federal Reserve, is you know somewhat of a Washington insider. It would be pretty tough for him to write a book where the United States didn't come out on top. You know, just politically and socially, that would be difficult for him to do. So I'm sure there's that element of it as well. But I think a lot of the stuff that he lays out is actually correct. Um, I don't think it would be quite so easy for China to win a currency war or a military war or even an economic war the way uh, it, it appears to me that a lot of other people believe they would be able to do. Now, as you said, Dr. Lindsay has, was on the Federal Board of Governors. He's, he's seen it from the inside and he spoke to the uh, policies made by people. And he really got to the bottom of that. And uh, both within uh, the US, all the central banks and, and China, he paints this this end game out uh, pretty straightforward. What did you think about his end game, and should we get into um, how he paints this and how this progresses? There's there's publics are fed up with the U.S. inflating. Uh, that's a debatable point, but the the continual printing of money through QE and various yeah. means, asset buying, um, and in, in in China there's a bank run, and it's it's come to a head on on both fronts that there needs to be some stability. Well, I thought it was kind of an interesting way that he came up with. Uh, with this now, and I'll say a couple things. I think again, this is my perception, and I might have it wrong, but my perception is there is a there is a call it kind of a small minority out there who believes that the United States is destined to return to a gold standard. And I would say I'm somebody who believes that gold is destined to rise, but whether or not we go back to a gold standard or not, I think is a big stretch. And, and the reason is because, and this is something I don't think was fully addressed in the book. Um, but essentially what they do in the book is they get into this currency crisis and essentially each side uses gold to kind of to try to back their currency in order to get a bit more legitimacy. Now, the reason that the, the, the gold standard is somewhat a romantic idea, for lack of a better word, and has, despite it not being used for a long time now, still has a, has, still has a, uh, a sense of, of purpose or a sense of legitimacy is because of all the crazy, for lack of a better word, lack of a better word, profligate policies that monetary authorities around the world have run for 40, 50, 60, or 100 years in some case. Um, you know, countries have gotten by by borrowing money cheaply and, you know, spending money that they don't have. And they do that in order to gain votes, right? You don't get vote. You don't gain votes by telling somebody they're going to have a hard life. You get votes by saying, I'm going to give this to you. And that person says, oh, thank you. I'll vote for you, right? So, And so we've gotten into this situation where countries around the world, not just the United States, countries around the world, including China, including many countries in Europe, including countries in South America, including Canada, including Australia, have run up the credit card. And now we have a situation where a lot of the global growth is not high enough to pay the credit card bill, essentially, right? And that, that's happening in real life, and that's what's happening in Larry Lindsay's book. And once, once confidence in any currency, whether it's the dollar, whether it's the yen, whether it's the real, whether it's the ruble, even gold, if somehow you could kill confidence in gold, the price would fall and nobody would want it, right? And so in the book, 
both the yuan, which is China's currency, and the dollar, which is the U.S.'s currency, is, the, the, is starting to lose confidence. Uh, investors around the world are starting to lose confidence in these currencies. And I think, as you said in his book, the, the euro has already lost confidence. So that wasn't really a main player in this book. Uh, but I think that's something that's really, really important to understand is that at the end of the day, currencies are about confidence. And I think he got that absolutely right. You know, if you believe that you hold a dollar and that somebody else is going to accept that dollar as payment, then the dollar is good. But if you feel like you're going to be walking around with this paper in your pocket and nobody's going to take it when you try to exchange it for good, you're, you're going to stop using that currency, right? And with, with, with governments running these, again, profligate policies, it brings back the idea of gold, right? And gold is a, is a currency that's been around for thousands of years. Now, it's not a government mandated currency, at least right now it's not. It's, it, it, it's, it's something that the market, in other words, just people as a whole has chosen as, as money throughout time. And so all the central banks still hold gold in their reserves. And part of the reason that central banks hold gold in reserves is not really because they want to go back to a gold standard. And, and I'll address that in a second. But basically, because they might have to go back to a gold standard, right? It's kind of, and, and it's, and, and I tell this to people a lot, and I think a lot of people just don't believe me when I say it, but in, in many ways, central banks hold gold for the same reason that you hold gold and the same reason I hold gold and that people all over the world hold gold. It's kind of an insurance policy. You know, we don't use gold, even if, I'm a gold owner, you're a gold owner, many other people. Are. We don't take gold down to the grocery store and exchange it for goods. So we don't really use it as a currency. It can be used as a currency, but we don't use it as a currency. We use it as a store of value. That's kind of what central banks do as well. They hold gold in reserve as a store of value in the unfortunate event that nobody longer accepts their fiat currencies. And that's in the book, that's kind of the situation they get into where the, there, there's a bank run in China, um, people are in China and, and even outside China are no longer wanting to hold the yuan. And then the same similar type of thing starts to happen in the US with regard to the US treasury bonds. And so um, they have a situation where they need to go into their reserves, their gold reserves and you know, back the currency with gold. Now, what I thought was interesting with the way Larry Lynch did it, and I'm actually glad he did it this way because it kind of helps prove a point of mine, is that he didn't go back to a classic gold standard. That wasn't his solution. Typically, in a classic gold standard, currency is backed by gold, and, you know, and it's this price, right? What he suggested doing was to set up gold coins, face value on those coins, and then, but they wouldn't be used for everyday exchange. You would still use dollars for everyday exchange. But if you bought these gold coins and you felt that the government was spending too much money, then you could exchange that gold coin um, for money. And if and if the price and and if, if 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 the dollar was losing value, you could you could melt it down to the gold value. Or or the interesting thing was if the price of gold fell below. You know, he had a $5,000 gold coin. The interesting thing was, is that he said if the price went below 5,000, you could still exchange it for 5,000. So it put some optionality into the gold and it made a US gold coin in some ways more valuable than a regular gold coin. Because if a regular gold coin went to $3,000, you would just have $3,000. But if a US gold coin went to $3,000, you could get $5,000 for it. And in that, that, that I, and the reason I think that that's interesting is he's still being a central banker, even though he is somewhat predisposed to a gold standard and kind of understands the idea and kind of likes the idea. He's not really proposing or he's not really advocating going back to a true gold standard, which I thought was a classic move for you know a politician or a central banker. It, it just kind of shows that while they know that gold could be a currency, they just really don't want it to be because it puts handcuffs on them, right? And nobody wants to have handcuffs put on them. Even if you understand why the handcuffs are important, nobody wants to have them on. And so anyway, I've kind of rambled on a little bit, but no. that, that's kind of the setting for the book. And I think it, I think it's a pretty interesting way that he, that he set it up. Yeah, I'm just going to pull up a quote. We, the Monetary Authority of the U.S., are effectively tying our own hands. We will not be able to endlessly print money because if we do, then the people of America and the people of the world now have the means to stop us. 
Because of this option, the Federal Reserve must avoid excessive money creation. Things get so bad. And as Lindsay says, um, inflation, you know, really pulls apart the social fabric. Uh, I think yeah. you've, you've spoke to this, but uh, I'm wondering if you can explain, you know, historically and, and looking at right now, wh- what are the signs that you're seeing that uh, we've got problems and this could get worse if we go, continue yeah. to go down this road? No, absolutely. Well, I'd say there's one thing to, to consider, and that is that if you look throughout history, um, typically whenever there is, not always, but a, a lot of times when there is social unrest, and especially typically when there is a revolution of some kind, it's, it, it happens when the people just can't take it anymore, for lack of a better word. And a lot of times that has to do with their cost of living. That's when they just can't take it anymore because they're hungry, they're out of work, they need money, and uh, the value of their currency is, is going down, or their savings is going down. And so if, you, if you're, the, you know, the, the, the French Revolution was a lot about, uh, you know, they were hungry, they were starving, you know, the whole let them eat cake, quote, come, comes because the revolutionaries were hungry. Um, if you look at uh, 10 years ago, I think it was about 10 years ago, I mean, I thought time flies, but uh, you know, the Arab Spring, you know, all the way from Northern Africa to the Middle East, um, you know, you, you saw these uh, these pushbacks against the autocra- autocratic, uh, autocratic governments. And it started because fuel prices and food prices were high and, and rising. Um, you know, over the last several years, you've seen a lot of uh, the social disruption in, in Turkey. It's because they have really high levels of inflation. Same in Argentina, same in uh, Lebanon, right? And so, you know, inflation is not just an economic thing. It, it is very much a social and a political phenomenon. And we're starting to see some of that in the United States here. Now, I think that there's this big debate right now of what come, you know, what are we in inflation or deflation? And, and I think it would be hard to say right now we haven't had inflation. It's pretty clear we've had inflation. The question is what comes next? And the problem, unfortunately, we don't have really much time to get into this in detail right now, but the, the problem that, that the monetary authorities have in trying to arrest this inflation that we're having, uh, first of all, they caused it. Like shutting down the global economy had massive supply chain disruptions. Again, I, without getting too much into the whole COVID and the health and the vaccines, Let's just, for the sake of argument, pretend it was a legitimate reason. <laughs> you can't just shut down a whole global machine and then expect to flip a switch and the machine just turns back on and works perfectly. It just doesn't work like that. And so they shut down the whole machine and they try it. They've tried to sort of turn it back on, but it's broken, right? And so you can't get goods shipped from China overnight to Wisconsin anymore, right? You can't get that car from Germany you know, to Florida overnight, to uh, the chips, the semiconductor chips from Taiwan that need to go on a calculator in Texas. It doesn't just happen overnight anymore. And so it's, it's caused these product delays. It's caused costs to go up. Um, and not only that, but then with the vaccine mandates, the people that work to unload the ships that do get there, there there's a lack of labor. And it, 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 it creates a whole set of problems that have nothing to do with money. I haven't even talked about this is just the logistics of it have caused prices to rise. And then on top of it, they tried to keep demand steady by printing, quote unquote, printing all this money. And so you have a situation where demand stayed high, supply got cut in half or whatever it was, and so prices rise. The problem with trying to combat it is really the the design of the monetary system itself. The, The monetary system is designed to grow. And like I mentioned, I don't have time to go into all the details, but because money is loaned into existence, the economies have to grow to service that debt. So every time money grows, debt grows. Well, that becomes a problem because eventually the debt gets so big that you can't outgrow it and then it collapses. So the challenge they have now, and it's fine, I just tweeted something out about this yesterday. Yesterday, you know, we had inflation prints at you know decade long highs, and we have the dollar at a year at, at, at a one-year high. Um, you know, the dollar's back where it was at higher than it was before COVID. And so a rising dollar is deflationary globally, but stimulus is inflationary. So they're trying to combat stimulus, right? Well, the way you would combat stimulus is you would raise rates or you would do something to slow the growth of money. But if they, if they, if they slow the growth of money or if they raise rates, then you end up 
pushing the whole system into deflation, which causes collapse. So they've really taken it to the edge here, right? And it's like, if you, if you fall this way, you fall into the fire. And if you fall this way, you fall into a bucket of ice. And neither one of them is good. They're literally on a racer's edge right now. And to me, this is the problem with a bunch of academics running things, right? Is it all works great in a spreadsheet and a model, but in the real world, it just doesn't quite work that way. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, you know, we're seeing these level, higher levels of inflation. Um, you're starting to see some unrest. Um, and I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here, but I think this is an important point to make is that in theory, everybody knows what to do. Just go buy real assets because they're going to inflate all the debt, debt away and you're going to be totally fine, right? It works that way in theory. And a year ago, people would say, yeah, they're just going to hold interest rates low. They're going to print money and they're going to inflate it away. Okay. That, and that, it's, it works great in theory. It's like, it's like you know, their models. It works great on the spreadsheet. The problem is, is the politics of inflation make implementing financial repression harder to do in reality than it is in the model. And what I mean by that is you're already seeing these rising prices are having political effects. Uh, Joe Manchin, who is the senator from West Virginia, is pushing back on the other Democrats' proposals to spend a lot of money. And he's pushing back because of the inflationary effects. You know, just yesterday, Joe Biden, you know, came out and said, I, I'm, I, he's going to set up some kind of a council to look at the rise in energy prices. He's pushing back on inflation. Well, which one is it going to be, right? Are you going to inflate it away and do financial repression? Or are you going to fight inflation? And, and the point is, is that when, when, when inflation hits a certain level, the political realities change such that financial repression is not as easy to implement in reality as it is in practice. And I think we're literally on this knife's edge of whether we continue in really high levels of inflation or whether the, hot, the rise in prices causes a compression in profits, which pushes it back into deflation. And so it, it's kind of hard to get your head around both of them, but it, it can literally fall either way right now. And I think investors in general um, need to be ready for both. Now we're talking about inflation here and in the book, um, they were primarily trying to combat against inflation. And, and, and that makes sense because this, eventually the central banks and the monetary, they will print enough and they will change policies enough that you know, people lose confidence in the currencies. And, and that's what the book deals with. Um, again, I kind of went off on a long tangent there, but I hope, I hope that helped uh, kind of explain the, 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 the scenario which we're in today and the scenario which, which they're in in the book. No, no, that was really good. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you can expand on, on financial repression. And also, I'm, yeah. I'm, I haven't been following it too closely, but it looks like the Bank of International Settlements and the, the, a lot of the central banks are looking to push a CBDC. And uh, unlike uh, uh, Dr. Lindsay's proposal of going back to something that the population trusts, it looks like perhaps a doubling down on uh, having something yeah. with more control ability to, to dial. Um, and, yes. and with that... Um, all of the issues coming to a head. We also have this this uh, as on death for for all of humanity with with environmental uh, yeah. policies and and does that exacerbate exactly what you're talking about? We're we're, we're doubling down. Well, I think it does. And, and to your point on you know the when, when Larry started writing this book, he probably I don't know maybe it came out this year or last year, but he probably started writing it two or three years ago. Um, digital currencies were starting to kind of be in, in vogue, but they probably weren't as in vogue when he was writing it as it is now. Um, but I do think we're going to have digital currencies. Um, you know, the Fed has said they're going to study it. The, the Euro, Europeans have said they're going to study it. China has announced they're going to roll out a digital yuan. And I, I think that that would be the more likely way they would go before they would go back to a gold standard. Um, I will say that's one of the flaws I think is in his book. In his book, um, one of the, the chairman of the Fed kind of proposes this gold, quasi gold standard. And he basically says, you know, we have to do it because just because we have to do it. Um, and in the book, everybody just kind of gets on board pretty quickly, right? I, I can absolutely guarantee you in the real world, they would never get on that quickly unless we were in the state of war <laughs> or literally the whole economy could really collapse the next day or in the next two days. And, and they're kind of setting the book up that that's the situation that it was in. Uh, but, but, but again, I, I, I can tell you that no government, no president, no Congress 
wants to relinquish their ability to spend whatever they want to spend. And so for, you know, for some guy to come in and say, hey, we need to go to the gold standard because it's the only way. And for the, you know, the, the House majority leader and the head of the Senate to just say, OK, no problem. It's a million years. It would never happen that way. So I think that I think that that was a little naive. But what I do think that they would get on board with very quickly is if there was a digital currency, which they could target towards their constituents and that they had control of, I think they would love that. And they could say, you know what, these green energy products in my state have to get funded. Uh, we are going to target that region or that area with these CBDCs. We are going to give them the funds necessary to build out their green infrastructure or their fund their green projects or whatever it is. And maybe they mandate the banks to extend credit. And what this is their finance, this, this would be part of the financial repression. If, if they do spending, but targeted spending and push the rate of inflation higher than the interest rate that's being paid in savings accounts or on debt, that's financial repression. And the way that that, the reason governments like financial repression is that it allows them to pay off their debts through inflation rather than actually paying it off. Now, for anybody who's kind of new that's listening to this that doesn't quite understand that, just think back to the, the price of your, the houses that your parents bought, you know, back in the 60s and 70s. I mean, I think my dad paid like twenty-five dollars or $30,000 for, for his house or, or the house that I grew up in, you know, and 30 years later, he sold it for, I don't know, $100,000 or $150,000. I don't even remember what he sold. But the point is, is the house was worth four or five, six times what it was when he bought it back in the 70s. Well, think about it with debt too. If you owed $25,000 for that house, and then 20 years later, that $25,000 house is worth $100,000, well, it's 75% easier to pay off. It's the same thing with the debt. If they borrow $100 billion now, but in 20 years from now, that $100 billion is it, it, the, 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 the modern day equivalent is $500 billion, well, it's really easy to pay off the $100 billion, right? And so, that's financial repression. And that's why, you know, when you hear grand, your grandpa talking about buying popcorn for a nickel or going to the movie for you know 25 cents or whatever it was, um, that's, that, that's, that's financial repression, that's inflation. And so um, I do think that governments largely want that. The problem is that like most things, like it's really easy to, again, I've said this many times, but it's just so true. It's like, it's easy to do it in in theory, it's hard to do it in reality. And I think many people heard the try to put toothpaste back in the tube analogy, right? Like it's really hard to get just a little bit of inflation. <laughs> you typically don't get much, don't get much, and you keep pounding on the tube. And then finally, just to, it just comes puking out, right? And that's kind of what's happened here. You know, they, they did a number of inflationary policies or what they believed to be inflationary policies since the global financial crisis. And, but because of all the bad debt in the world, the debt was just weighing down and they couldn't really generate the inflation. And so they just kept doing more and more and more. And then finally, when they shut the whole economy down in, in conjunction with doing more, then you get this just puking of this inflation, right? Prices spiked, right? Now the question becomes, do they continue to spike at the same rate or do they kind of ebb back into where they came from? And I, I don't, I think there's a lot of people who are just convinced that inflation is here to stay. And it might be, I can't rule that out. I think you have to be ready for it, but I, I don't think it's as a given as many people think it is. Again, back to the reasons that we talked about a while ago, you know, we're kind of right on that razor's edge. Yeah. And as you said, uh, what is it? The highest inflation print since 1982. I mean, that's significant yeah. for, for in the U.S. And we all know the uh, statistics are, are, are somewhat questionable on, on how it's sure. measured. Um, sure. But you did bring up the, the Arab Spring and the consequences to to other countries. We tend to obviously focus on our on our own, you know, back door and, yeah. and, and cost of milk that we're paying. But um, yeah. what does this do to periphery states that aren't uh, one? The U.S. Uh, you know, the the, the yeah. world hegemon uh, controls the currency, um, and and then obviously all, all the other central banks that are completely reliant on 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 the center of the monetary authority, being the Fed. What happens to those other countries? And and if we're starting to see problems here. What does that look like abroad in your, in, in your eyes? Well, I think it looks even worse abroad, to be honest. Uh, this is, uh, you, you've probably heard me talk about my milkshake theory, and this, this is essentially it. Um, 
because the U.S. is the world's you know kind of global hegemon and been the you know the biggest market for many years now. China's you know now surpassed us from, from just a global market perspective. But uh, the U.S. is either the number one or two biggest markets you know in the world, depending on how you look at it. And so we have been looked at you know from around the world for forever. And so it's very easy to focus on the problems of the United States. It's easy to focus on the advantage of the United States. You know the culture of the United States, the media of the United States. And so the, the world, you know, all of the world kind of looks to us, but I think there's a danger in just looking at the United States. Uh, so it's easy to look at the United States and the Fed and say, there are, you know, these profligate policies just cannot last. The dollar is doomed to die. They're just printing money they don't have. And I don't really argue with those points because they're true. Um, the U.S. dollar is a really a horrible currency and it's been mismanaged really poorly. The issue is that there are no other countries where it's really been done any better. You know, the, I, I have not much, uh, I mean, respect is probably the right word for central bankers and politicians. But, you know, you don't leave the borders of the United States and all of a sudden central bankers and politicians become these saints. You know, they're, they're kind of the same everywhere. And they're kind of irresponsible and profligate everywhere. And so that we have in the United States, we have in you know, Libya, and we have in Lebanon, and we have in Italy, and we have in Canada, and we have in Australia, and we have in Brazil, and we have in China and Japan. It, it, it's kind of the same all over the place. And so what the difference is, is that while the U.S. has definitely mismanaged its finances, and it is definitely, you know, doing everything it can to in increase the supply of money, there is also incredible demand for dollars. And that just, I think many people overlook that. They focus on the supply, supply is increasing, and so therefore price must fall. Well, demand is rising as well. Demand is high and is rising. And that is not the case for other currencies. You know, nobody outside of Europe or very little outside, euros are not really needed outside of Europe. There are a little bit, but not much. Same with yen. There's a little bit of the yen that's needed outside of Japan, but not a lot. But, you know, you don't need Brazilian reals outside of Brazil. You, you don't need the uh, South African rand outside of South Africa. You don't need Australian dollars outside of Australia. You don't need Canadian dollars outside of Canada. And so there's just not this huge demand for these periphery country currencies. And if they're increasing supply as well, but there's not the same level of demand as there is for the dollar, then the dollar can rise relative to these other foreign currencies. Now, it may be falling versus real assets. Maybe it's falling versus gold or Bitcoin or, or whatever it is. But it can outperform all the other fiat currencies. And so what happened, what, what you get into a situation with these periphery countries is they're having high levels of inflation in their domestic currencies, but they're having deflationary pressures in U.S. dollars. And the problem is, is that they trade in U.S. dollars and they, a lot of times they fund their businesses and countries in U.S. dollars. So if your funding costs are rising because the dollar's rising, but you're losing purchasing power in your domestic currency because that's what you purchase, you know, your local goods and your food and your, you know, your clothes and stuff with, you're, you're getting squeezed from both ends. And what that forces the governments there to do is spend more money to stimulate more to get the current to the country to grow. But then you get it, you know, now their supply is increasing and even more. It kind of becomes this vicious circle. So, and then you get these high levels of inflation, and then you get the social pushback, the Arab Spring, you know, the French Revolution. You know, throughout history, that this is just typically what happens. And so, same thing happened in Weimar, right? Um, you know, I try not to use hyperinflation too often because it gets a little silly and I think I think it's an overused term. But the same thing has happened in Venezuela, the same thing has happened in Argentina. Um, you know, their government's printed their local currency, but there's no external demand. So the currency just loses value against real things. And I think we're going to start to see that it will. And I, so I think it will be on the periphery and it will, you know, it'll get closer and closer. it will eventually come home to roost in the United States. But, but I think there's a progression. I think it starts on the periphery first and works its way in. So while I think it ends very badly for the United States, I don't think it ends yet. And I think, uh, it ends for other countries on the periphery before it ends for the United States. You know, I know, uh, before I forget, uh, I know you're in Canada. Um, for if uh, I assume you have a lot of Canadian listeners. You know, again, it's very easy to kind of take shots at the United States. And, and I get it. Believe me, I get it. Um, but, you know, the, the Fed's balance sheet 
uh, or I'm sorry, the monetary base of the United States over the last 20 years has increased uh, 800%. Do you have any idea how much it's increased in Canada? Uh, I don't want to forecast the length of that hockey stick. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's over a thousand percent. So yeah, we've increased our monetary base, but you guys have increased it by 20% more than we have. Um, if you look at the debt to GDP ratios in Canada, it's much worse than many other developed countries. If you look at the debt to income ratio, it's amongst the worst in the, in the G20. Um, you know, you look at the amount of debt to, in the housing market and it makes the housing issues that we had in 2008 look like child's play. Now it doesn't mean that it's all going to end tomorrow, but it doesn't mean that it's not either. Right. And I guess this is part of my point is that if all these things were just happening in the United States, it would be very easy to figure out what to do, but because it's kind of happening everywhere, it's, a, it's really tough. It's just really hard. And I don't pretend to have all the answers. Um, but I know it's not as simple as a lot of people think it is. Agreed. And, and you can take shots, uh, across any bow anytime. And I won't take offense, but, oh. um, I was in I was in the Middle East uh, when, when the Arab Spring occurred. So yeah, I was, I was studying there at the time and wasn't aware of of, of exactly what was what was causing everything to, to go on. But I mean, you are tracking on a daily basis the the cost of commodities, the cost of foodstuffs, the cost of fuel. What are you seeing on your screen? Are you starting to see flags? I mean, you, you you've stated that you're you're, yeah, you're yeah, seeing yeah yeah yeah. I think so. I I've stated publicly that I think that it's. Once I think that some of these supply chain issues are going to get out, so I think some of these inflationary pressures are going to get relief, but some of them are not. So I think we're going to have this stagflationary environment for probably a couple of years, and so I think we're going to have some stuff that continues to inflate, and stuff that some stuff that continues to deflate. So you know, I know a lot of people are focused on commodities, but I feel like a lot of them are kind of on the energy side. Um, you know, maybe the industrial side. You know, copper, nickel, aluminum. And then those have certainly had had nice runs over the last year. I'm not as bullish on those as I am on the agricultural commodities. I think the food stuffs, uh, you know, corn, wheat, soybeans, stuff like that, I think in the next few years are going to do incredibly well. Um, I've actually, I own, we own some equities and stuff that, that are, uh, you know, playing in that area and that they've, they've done really well. Um, but, you know, just buying the commodities themselves, I've kind of been waiting for a pullback, but, you know, we just might not get it. You know, typically I'm pretty patient and I just kind of wait, you know, you'll see a breakout and it'll come back. And, you know, I've been trying to be patient, but, you know, at some point you just got to get in. And so I, I, I'm probably not going to buy them yet, but I'm looking to buy them. And like I said, I always reserve the right to change my mind. I might hang up and decide to go buy some now, but uh, I've been waiting for kind of a pullback in some of these and we just haven't had it. So, um, you know, I th but I do think over the next couple of years, that's going to be an important place to be. Now, just to, to throw a curveball in here, let's let's say um, the current politicians, the central bankers, are actually brilliant and yeah. do have control of this and yeah. are conducting a, a complete breakup of, of the current monetary regime, um, yeah. the supply chains we've had uh, set up for, for 20 years that have bolstered our enemies uh, to the detriment of our own domestic populations. And, and this is a restructuring. Um, is, is that something that, uh, you know, maybe they do have control of the wheel right now? Well, I, I, it's funny. I, I, I try not to go down the conspiratorial path too, too far because you can kind of get lost down in the rabbit hole. But, you know, on the, same, on the same token, a lot of things make more sense when you believe in the conspiracy theory. It just, it just fits better, right? Um, and and, and I, to me, and it's funny, I've talked to a friend of mine back in San Francisco about this several times. To me, the scariest thing about the last, call it 18 months is, for me, it wasn't COVID itself. It was never the health part of it. What was the most scary to me was how quickly and efficiently and without much protest, they shut down the whole world. <laughs> I just, I, when I think back about it, like everybody just said, okay. And I just, it's just really incredible to me. Um, and so, you know, if it, again, the whole world is kind of in this same situation, right? You know, if you were to just let the system run as it's designed, it will collapse. I mean, it's just a mathematical certainty. And I suppose if you recognize this from a, you know, government policy level, you would have to figure out some way to institute control when people just lost their minds because the whole economy went down, right? And so from that perspective, you know, maybe, you know, you need to come up with some reason to, 
help control them, right? And what better way to do that than through a scary virus that has everybody, you know, on edge? Um, you know, I, again, I, I, I have a hard time giving them enough credit to think that they're smart enough to actually do that and then actually pull it off. But, you know, I guess crazier things have happened. Um, but, you know, there is going to need to be a reset of some kind, a monetary reset. Um, and again, this is not conspiracy. This is not me being dramatic. I'm not trying to like scare people. Like it's just mathematic. It's just a mathematic certainty. You know, again, debt-based money has to grow. If it doesn't grow, it collapses. At some point, the debt gets so big. It, you know, if you've ever seen an exponential curve, it'll go up like that, but then it'll eventually just crash. And again, it's just really simple math. And that is the kind of system we have. We have our monetary system it is an exponential system. So at some point, whether it's today or whether it's 30 years from now, it will crash. And when it crashes, it's going to be really scary. And so, you know, you know, the, there will have to be a reset. Um, and I think that's the, that's the point that this book was making as well, is that we will get to a point where fiat currencies will come under pressure, uh, where the confidence in them will be lost and something will have to be done to reinstill confidence. And whether it's, whether they reinstill that confidence uh, through an economic standpoint or whether they do it through a military standpoint or whether they do it through, you know, something else, I don't know. My, 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 I don't think it will go as easy as laid out in this book. This book is a pretty smooth, you know, there's some drama in it. It's actually a really good book. I would recommend reading it. I really enjoyed it. Um, but it will not be smooth. It will, it, it, there is going to be some, some, some very scary moments. And, and I, I don't want this to happen, by the way. You know, I think a lot of people think I'm this doomsayer and I'm trying to scare. I'm not trying to, I'm not a negative guy. I just, you know, I, I can do math and I, I know that this will happen at some point and I, and I need to be prepared for it. Um, but, uh, you know, the, typically what happens when you get these societal um, unravelings, for lack of a better word, is unfortunately you get, you know, authoritarian, you know, uh, response. I mean, the Arab Spring is a perfect example. You know, in many ways, they were rioting against government policies and the fact that they were hungry and, you know, the, their energy prices were rising. But the way that, but, you know, the, this was happening in countries that were authoritarian. And the way they quashed these riots was authoritarian and they used the military and people were killed and you know people were injured and people were rounded up and thrown in jail and that's typically the way governments handle it they don't typically just come out and say okay we screwed up what do you want us to do right that i i can't ever remember that happening ever in history maybe it's happened but i can't remember it happening so my guess is that when this when the when we get these um social unrest it will be met with force and authoritarianism. And I think that's going to be the hardest part to manage. Um, I think uh, perhaps naively, I think I'll be able to figure out the financial part of it. Um, the part that I'm not sure I'll be able to hand, figure out. To end. And I think the hardest part to manage will be the societal part of it. So I, I think that's the most, I think that's the most uncertain and that's going to be the hardest to actually deal with on the day to day basis. Unfortunately, I agree with you. And I'm, I follow you and, and uh, a number of your talks and others looking, looking for those, those red flags that are being hoisted and it seems that they're, they're coming up faster and faster. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, before we go, I'm just wondering, uh, apart from yeah. the recommendation of, uh, of, of currency war by, uh, by uh, Larry Lindsay, yeah. is there, is there another book that you, that you're looking at right now saying this is the one. I just interviewed the guy that wrote this book. It's called prisoners of geography. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. And he just came out with another one this week that I, 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 uh, I haven't got to read it yet, but I'm planning to. It's called The Power of Geography. And many people don't realize that the geography, like where you live geographically, plays such a huge role in a country's development, um, how they grow, why they grow, what kind of an economy they have, what kind of military they have, what kind of military they need to have, is influenced by geography. And regardless of how... Uh, how you might like to run something, you might not be able to run it that way due to, you know, the geographical landscape on, on which, which you find yourself. And this it's a very simple book. Uh, I give him a lot of credit because he takes kind of a complex subject, but 
but whittles it down into a very simple and easy to understand um, um, way of writing. And so I highly recommend it. So it's called Prisoners of Geography. It's by Tim Marshall. Um, that would be my number one book recommendation for anybody listening. And uh, although your reputation typically precedes you, if uh, people don't know you, where, where can they best find you or yeah. contact you? I'm always happy to talk to people and uh, you can email me if you want to. You, you, I have a website that just has my contact information on it. So it's just SantiagoCapital.com. Um, so you can send me an email. I'm very active on Twitter. Um, Santiago AU Fund is my handle. But if you just type in Santiago Capital or Brent Johnson, you'll typically find it. Um, you know, I've done a number of these types of podcasts and, and interviews and stuff. And so if you go to Google or YouTube and type in Brent Johnson, Santiago Capital, um, that there's a number of uh, hits that will come up. And um, again, I, I appreciate you inviting me on. I always enjoy these types of conversations. And I, I, it's kind of fascinating and kind of exciting, but it's kind of scary as well. Um, but uh, I think the, kind of the more you think through it, maybe the better you prepare it or when it actually happens. Definitely. Well, thanks for your time today, Mr. Johnson. All right. Thanks for having me.